Hello, I'm Cal Wellborn, acarologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. Good morning. In this session, we are going to talk about a careform morphology with emphasis on the prostigmata. The acari, if it is monophyletic, is divided into two main groups, the parasitiformes and the acariformes. As far as mites associated with plants, we're concerned with only two major groups, the mesostigmata and the prostigmata. While the other groups may occur, some of the other groups may occur on plants, they are not of economic importance. And for this, this talk, we're going to talk mainly about the prostigmata, because this is where our plant feeding mites occur. Just to review some of the characters for separating the parasitiformes or mesostigmata from the acariformes. The mesostigmata have lateral, have lateral stigmata and paratremes. Coxa is a free moving segment. The nathosome has a tectum. This is a structure that's on top of the nathosome. The palps are linear with a claw like structure, an apoteal on the tarsus. Cholesterol are usually chelate, dentate, especially for the ones we're talking about associated with plants. And most mesostigmata have a hypostomal groove, a structure on the underside of the nathosoma that may have little teeth-like structures in it. But this is present on all the mesostigmata that we're concerned with. I care for mites. Almost all, the, almost all the phytophagous mites are in the, are in the prostigmata. Some of the other groups have a few plant feeding mites, but they're not economically important. Also, a lot of predators found on plants are in the prostigmata. Again, the characteristics of the cariformes emphasizing the prostigmata. Coxa is fused to the body, it's not a movable segment. Stigmata and paratremes are either on the clissary, the base of the clissary, or on the anterior dorsum. Trichobot prodorsal trichobothria, present or absent. They're usually in about the same place on the prodorsum. Palps are usually modified. Uh, they can be shortened. What most likely happens is what we call thumb claw, where there is a claw-like seta or structure on the palp tibia, and the palp tarsus may be reduced or, mod or moved off to the lateral side so it appears not to be the terminal segment. Clister are almost always modified in the prostigmata. This is a case of a tetranicoid where it's all that you see here is the, the two movable, or movable stylets. That's all that's left of the clistera. Most prostigmata have eyes, although they don't visually see something, we suspect they can tell light from dark. Uh, this is a summary of characters between showing the cariformes and parasitiformes. Again, the hypostomal groove is present in the parasitiformes. And think of these in terms of the mesostigmata, which we're mostly concerned with. They have you, try to sternum. They have the nathosomal tectum, although it can be hard to see. Palp tarsus has an apoteal. Uh, they don't have the dorsal sejugal burrow, but we haven't talked about that yet. Um, they don't have trichobothria. They don't have genital pili. They have lateral stigmata and paratremes, and the coxal segment, leg segment, is movable. To separate the prostigmata from the other acariformes, the orbatids and the astigmata, clits are usually modified. In the orbatids and astigmata, they're mostly chelate dentate. Palps are almost always reduced or thumb claw or variously modified, whereas in the orbatids and the astigmata, they are uh, five segmented, uh, two segmented in the astigmata. Another character that's useful, if they're red, green, yellow, they're most likely prostigmata. The uh, orbatids and astigmata are brown, black, or white in the case of a lot of astigmata. They're not very colorful. Life cycle of the cariformes. Basic a cariform life cycle is the prelarva, larva, protonymph, deuteronymph, tritonymph, and adult. 
Okay. We're dealing with a biological system, a very large system of uh, large system. We're dealing with a biological system which has a large number of species, and so there's going to be variation. Uh, take the Atomistidae. They have a elatostase prelarva. That is, it walks around. It doesn't feed, but it walks around. Otherwise, their, their life cycle is normal. The larva, feeding larva, feeding protonymph, dunymph, trinymph, adult. Then we have the parasit and gona. These are chiggers, water mites, erythreids. They have an alternating life cycle of inactive prelarva, inactive protonymph, inactive trinymph. They have an active larva, which is a, a parasite of arthropods or vertebrates. They have a free-living predator dunymph and a free-living predator adult. So if you're out collecting, you're only going to find a larva or a dunymph or an adult. You're never going to see the prelarva, the protonymph, or the trinymph. For many years, people thought they didn't exist, but actually they exist within the cuticle. For instance, the protonymph is in the cuticle under the cuticle of the larva. The dudonymph is under the cuticle of the protonymph, and so on. Okay, we we'll get to the tetranychidae, which is one you're most familiar with. Again, they have a prelarva, but it's very reduced. They have a normal larva, three pairs of legs. They have the protonymph, dudonymph, and adult. There are a few exceptions, tuckerella being one. But most spider mites that we're dealing with have just a protonymph, a dudonymph, and the adult in addition to the larva. Then we get to the tarsonemids. They have a larva and an adult. Those are the only two active stages they have. That's all you're going to find. And then the extreme case in the prostigmata are the pimotidae. These are obligate insect parasites. And the females are what we call physogastric. That is, they retain the eggs inside the body. And they develop completely into adults. So the female gives birth to adult mites. So the only active stage you will ever find is the adult. OK, talking about important character systems in the prostigmata. The ideosomal ketotaxi. This is probably one of the most important set of characters you need to learn. As we've said before, the mites are divided into nathosoma, which includes the palps, the clissory, and the subcapitulum, and the mouth. And the idiosoma, which is divided into prodorsum and opistosoma. Now, there's a whole bunch of different terminology used for the prodorsum and opistosoma. There's histrosoma, there's uh, aspidosoma, and so on. I'm only going to use prodorsum and opistosoma. On both the prodorsum and the opistosoma, the ketotaxi are very important. We'll talk about the prodorsum first. Here's the, the nathosome. Here's your clissory, here's your palps, and some of it's hidden underneath the anterior part of the idiosoma. This is the idiosoma from the anterior end to the back. This is divided dorsally into the prodorsum and opistosoma. In the prodorsum, we have the naso, which is only present in some der uh, less derived groups or primitive groups, but normally we have four pairs of prodorsal CD. The internal verticals, which are anterior, the external verticals, which are usually more lateral to the internal verticals, the internal scapulars, and the external scapulars. Normally, if we're going to have prodorsal trichobothria, the internal scapulars or the internal verticals are the ones that are going to be trichobothria. The external verticals, external scapulars are never trichobothria. So you are going to eliminate right now, you only have to look for possibly two sets of prodorsal trichobothria. The prodorsum is set off from the rest of the idiosoma by the dorsal sejugal suture. In this particular example, I chose it because it's easy to see. In a lot of groups, you cannot see it. But if you know how many prodorsal CD to expect, it's easy to see where the division is between the prodorsum and the opistosoma. You're going to close up looking at this prodorsum, prodorsal CD. This is the internal scapulars. Here is your bothridial base. This is important to, to know in prostigmata whether the prodorsal CD have trichobothria. Here's a close up. And this is a normal CD. This will be the external verticals. Okay. 
Okay, here's a, a, a tidied mite, Iolanid. Here's your dorsal sujugal suture. This separates the prodorsum from the opistosoma. Since we're talking about the prodorsum now, we have four pairs of CD, uh, the internal verticals, the um, external verticals, internal scapulars, and external scapulars. Another structure, this is structure we see here, is the dehiscent line. This is where the cuticle will split when it molts. You don't usually see this. This is a nice, nice feature on this particular slide, this particular specimen. You can see it. And if you notice how it sort of bends in here, this is what's called procurved. And when that happens, it takes the internal verticals that are normally up here and moves them down here. The point of this is there are four pairs of prodorsal CD. In some cases, they can be rearranged the way we normally would think of them to be. In this case, right. in this case, the internal verticals are moved to where they're posterior to the internal scapulars. And that's because the dehiscent line moves them. But in most cases, your internal verticals are going to be anterior part followed by the external verticals, the internal scapulars, and the external scapulars. One of the things that turns people off to prostigmata and many mites is the confusing nomenclature. Spider mites are a great example. For many years, every time someone worked on a different family, they invented their own terminology. So if you worked on spider mites 30 years ago, you had your own terminology for spider mites. If you worked on phytoseids, you had your own terminology. If you worked on Delids, you had your own terminology. If you worked on anistids, you had your own terminology. If you worked on parasitengones, you had a different terminology. Back in the 30s and 40s, an acrologist named Francois Grandjean came up with a system for naming opistosomal CD. And for many years, only people who worked on orbatids followed it. Starting in the 1990s, an effort was made to make the, the nomenclature for the prostigmata more consistent. So that when you see a particular CETA, you can find that same CETA on different taxa. Uh, this chart just shows you some of the old terminology used for the spider mites. This, the CDEF system, is what we're using now. And in this case, here's your dorsal sejugal suture, which you cannot really see. But you have your prodorsal CD. In this case, there are three pairs. And now we have CETA that are aligned in horizontal rows. We'll go in more detail on this in, in the next slide. OK. The epistosomal ketotaxi. We refer to the rows as C, D, E, F, H. And then PS are the ones on the anal valves. And then if it has anamorphosis, it will add up to three more segments through ontogeny. Then we have the genital CD and adgenital CD, which are associated with the genital region. Now, the ones here in red are dorsal opistosomal CD. The ones in purple are ventral. And the ones in blue are ones that are added when anamorphosis occurs in a particular taxon. Now, you're lucky in that. For most of the, the mites we deal with, as far as for say with plants, anamorphosis does not occur. So the epistal ketotaxy only goes to the PS and the genitals and adgenitals. So if we look at the specimen over here, we have your dorsal sigugal suture, which is very easy to see. We have your prodorsum with your four pairs of prodorsal CD. And then we start immediately posterior to the dorsal sigugal suture, the first pair of CD in the center part of the opistosoma are the CUCD, C1. Moving laterally, you have C2. Maximally, you usually have up to three. Then we move more posterior, we have the D row. It can also have up to three CD. E row, which also can have up to three CD. The F row, 
uh, again, three CD. When we get to the F row, sometimes they sort of bend posteriorly. And then we get to the H. They're usually uh, terminal. You can have up to three pairs of HCD. Usually H2 and H3 are ventral. It's important, I can't stress how important it is to learn these, this ketotaxi arrangement. C row, D row, E row, F row. It's especially important in the spider mites because to get to genus and many spider mites, you have to know how many HCD there are. Are there two pairs of HCD or are there three pairs of HCD? And if you can't figure out what the other CD are, you won't know how many H's. What we normally do is we figure out how many C's, D's, E's, F's. Then we look at the genitals and add genitals. And then anything that's left has to be HCD. This is probably the hardest thing for, for beginning people to get. But once, they, once you get it, it applies to all the prostigmata that you might look at. There are exceptions. We're dealing with a biological system. And there are some mites that are hypertrichous. That is, they add extra CD. And there are some mites that are hypotrichous, where they lose some of the basic CD. But for most, most groups, the CDEFH works very well. If we go ventrally, again, the ones here in red, up in the upper left, are the dorsals. Ventrals are these CD. So this is a female spider mite. They're easier to work with. Uh, these uh, convoluted cuticle tells you it's a female. OK, so a anterior to the genital region, we have a pair of adgenitals. In this case, we have two pairs of genitals, one here, one here. This is the genital opening. And then posterior to that, we have the anal opening. And on the anal valves, we have the pseudanal CD, the PSCD. Two pairs, can be three pairs or one pair. And then here we have the ventral HCD. This is H3, this is H2, and in this particular specimen, H1 shows up. Sometimes, depending on how you mount the specimen, you may have a H1 CETA that appears ventral or an H2 CETA that appears dorsal, and that's a mounting issue. But once you learn what all these CD are, and from there, you can figure out exactly which CD you're looking at. It's nice to have good mounted specimens, but we don't always get great specimens to look at. But once you learn the system, every, no spider mites a problem to getting to the, the, the genera. This applies to all the, the prostigmata. The exceptions are the uh, parasitic gones, but we're not talking about those here. OK, just another spider mite. This is the dorsal. I put this in here because we're talking about specimens that have been mounted on a slide, flattened. And sometimes you have a trouble. Because here on this specimen, you can see the, the female genital region through here. And so you have to be very careful how you focus so you're not looking at a dorsal CD, looking at a ventral CD when you're trying to look at dorsal CD. And my suggestion for that, when you're working with these, find a CD that you know is dorsal. Some structure you know is absolutely dorsal, and then work from there. So in this case, we have our C1 CD, our D1. These are always in pairs. D1, here's your D2s, here's your E1s, E2s, and F, F1s. And notice F2 is more posterior. This happens with the, sometimes the E's, but mostly the F's and the H's, they tend to, to move more, more uh, posterior. In the case of spider mites and uh, raphidnathoids in general, they do not have anamorphosis, so you don't have any ADs, ANs, or PAs. You just have the CDEFH, the genitals, and the adgenitals. Those are the only CD on the opistosoma. They also have structures called cupules. These are small stress receptors. They're not always visible in all groups, uh, but Again, I, you don't usually see them on spider mites, but some of the other groups, you will see them. 
Just another view. This is a whole spider mite. Here's your, where your dorsal sejugal furrow would be, or dorsal sejugal uh, suture. Most spider mites have three or four pairs of prodorsal CD. Here we have three pairs. Here's the C1 row, D1 row, E1 row, F, your H's. So they count, again, laterally, C1, C2, C3, D1, D2, E1, E2, F1, F2. And then your, your prodorsal region, you have your one, two, three pairs of prodorsal CD. This is your nathosoma, your palps. Again, look at another example. Here's the ventral view. Here we have your adgenitals. The anterior end of the, of the mite is on the right side of the slide. The adgenitals, one pair of genitals, two pairs of genitals. Um, Somehow that adgenital marking got moved. PS, two pairs of PSs. That's not an adgenital. That should, that, unfortunately, that label should be up here. Okay, clissary, often modified. Fusion of the clissary with each other or the subcapitulum and reduce, reduction of the fixed digit. Okay, the clissary divided into three parts. Your, your clissural base, your movable digit, your fixed digit. Clistral bases can be separate, like shown in this particular figure. They can be fused medially, where they might appear separate, but medially they're together. They can be fused into a stylophore, where both clistral bases fuse into one structure that you can't tell anything they were ever separate. And the stylophore can be just a stylophore of the clistral bases, or it could be a stylophore capsule where it's actually fused to the base of the subcapitulum. So the nathosome, the subcapitulum, and the clistary bases are all one unit that look like it's, you can't tell them apart. The movable digit is frequently modified into a stylet in the prostigmata. Fixed digit is modified, reduced, frequently absent. And just to remind you, all prostigmata are fluid feeders. So this affects how they how their clissary are modified. So in this figure, here we have the clissural base, your fixed digit, your movable digit. In this case, this is a, a tetranicoid. This is the, the movable digit. Actually, it's a pair of movable digits. They come together to form a, a long stylet for piercing plant tissue. Here's an example of prostigmata uh, clistra, where it's, this is a stylophore. In the case of the tetranicoids, it's retractable. Here's the stylophore here. Um, and right here, this, this can actually be pulled back into the body, and the clistral stylets are actually retracted, retractable into the body. Modifications of the palp. Variable number of segments from one to five. Variable morphology, primarily linear or thumb claw. Here's a linear palp. There's your tarsus, tibia, genu, and your femur would be down in here. Here's a thumb claw. Here's your palp tarsus, palp tibia, genu, and the claw-like structure is on the tibia. Now on this side, the claw-like is missing, so uh, you don't want to get Confused by that, this is the normal one where you have your palptibial claw, sometimes called a claw-like ceta. It's really just a modified ceta. Your tibia, your tarsus is reduced and sometimes moved off laterally. The view I, uh, of the anterior end of a tetranicidae. Here's your palptibia. Here's your palptibial claw or claw-like ceta. Here's your palptarsis. Here's, the, in this case, it's a spider mite. This is the big eupathid that's a spinneret where they produce the silk. But you want to, you're looking for this claw-like structure to determine whether it's thumb claw. This is an important character. 
You're never going to find that in, in other acariformes, non-prostigmata. You're not going to find it in those groups. Leg ketotaxi. Okay, the leg of prostigmata, coxa, I don't count the coxa as a movable, it's not a movable segment, so I usually don't count it. The first movable segment is your trochanter, femur, genu, tibia, tarsus, and then you have your what's called a pretarsus. We'll talk about that a little later. Trochanter doesn't have any specialized CD. It may have CD on it, but no specialized CD. The femur can be either entire or divided. If it's divided, it's divided into a base of femur or telofemur. Occasionally, the femur will have specialized chemoreceptors or solanidia called theta. This is very rare. It doesn't occur in, in spider mites, but it does occur in some groups. The genu has two types of special, can have two types of specialized CD. The sigma, which are solanidia, chemoreceptors, and what's called microceta K. It's a little tiny ceta that can occur on the genu. Tibia can have solanidia, chemoreceptors, called phi, and may have a microceta K. Usually the microceti on the genu and tibia are only on legs one, occasionally leg two, rarely on leg three. Then we get the tarsus. This is where most of the specialized CD occurs. We have our chemoreceptors, omega, solanidia. We have famulus, which is a, usually a small ceta. We don't know the function. I have eupithidia, which are modified normal CD for chemoreception. And then in some groups, mainly tetranicidae, we have what's called duplex CD. Okay, all legs have normal CD. These are basically mechanoreceptors. They take all kinds of shapes. They can be long, thin, nude CD. They can be highly branched or have very fine sequels, but these are always on all the segments. These are not specialized CD. These are mechanoreceptors. Sometimes the type of CD on the legs can help you identify it. Legs can have trichobothria. As far as we're concerned, only one group, the deloidea, will have a leg trichobothria, and that is they have a bothridial base on a ceta that's on, on the leg, usually on the tarsi. Only if you find leg trichobothria, you know you have a deloid, and that's a predator mite. Quite common on plants. Eupithidia, these are specialized chemoreceptors. They're only on the tarsus of the legs and tarsus of the, of the palp. These are usually nude CD. They may be pointed, they may be rounded. There's some specialized chemoreceptors. They have microceta K. These are usually small, rounded, or pointed CD. Here's examples on erythreids. Here's an example on tarsinema. In this case, it's bifurcate. This is a solenidian or a chemoreceptor CD. This would be phi, because this is on tibia. Then we have um, famulus. This is another specialized ceta. We don't know the function of it, but it's only on the tarsi. It's always associated with a solanidia on the tarsus. In this case, this is the famulus here. In some groups, uh, famulus is like a little flower or star-like structure. But in most cases, the famulus is just a small, pointed, rounded ceta. Don't know the function of the ceta. It's only found on the tarsi of legs one and two. And then we have, here's an example of a famulus. This is on a, a pentheleus. Here's your uh, solanidia omega on the tarsus leg one. Okay, we have solanidia. These are chemosensory CD. These are specialized CD. Uh, under a light microscope, you'll, sometimes they look like they're striated. If you get enough magnification, you can actually see the fenestra or openings on the ceta. This is their main way for main. This is the main structure for tasting their environment. These are usually on the tarsi, the 
palps and the legs. They can also be on the tibia, genu, rarely on the femur. And we uh, identify them by the leg segment they're on. Theta is on the femur, sigma on the genu, phi on the tibia, omega on the tarsus. So you might see a key where, say, omega absent on tarsus leg one. So you know the solenoid is absent. Unfortunately, a lot of the old text, old books, don't use these terms. They may refer to all, all kinds of things, either solenidia or chemosensory CD or so on. So these are terms we're using now, and all new, new things that come out will have these, use these, these characters. Another, most of the time, the solenidia are erect. They stick out perpendicular or nearly perpendicular to the leg, so they're easy to see. In some groups, they have what we call recumbent solenidia. They are parallel with the, the leg of the segment, and so they're laying down in like a groove. They're also called regidial organs, but all they are is solenidia that are recumbent. Here's the leg of a tidioid. Here's your tarsus. Here's your tibia and genu. Okay. Here is omega. This is solnidia on the tarsus. This may or may not be the famulus. I, I can't tell. It may be just a, a spot of dirt. You need more magnification to see it. On the tibia, here we have phi. Here we have microceta K. And genu, we don't see any specialized CD here. Okay, we'll look at duplex CD. These are unique to the tetranicidae, where you have a long solnidian. And solnidia are normally round-tipped, but in some cases they are pointed. In this case, they're, they're pointed with a very short normal ceta right in the, almost coming out of the same base. We look over here, we see the, the solnidia and omega, and then your normal ceta FT. Now, one way to tell the difference between a solnidian and a normal ceta is the solnidia are hollow. I know you might think, how do we tell it's hollow? Well, if you go high enough magnification and you look towards the base, you can see where it's actually lighter colored in the middle, whereas if you look at a normal ceta, it's solid all the way through it. It's the same consistency. That's a way of telling whether it's the solnidia or not. But the duplex CD are important characters in the tetranicidae. Modification of the pretarsus. Okay, the pretarsus, basic form, a pair of claws, or sometimes called true claws, and impodium. Three structures. Is a basic pretarsus. The claws can be, are usually paired. They can be claw-like. They may actually look like a claw, or they can be pad-like. The impodium is a single structure between the claws. It can be pad-like or claw-like. And then the, the claws or impodium may or may not have tenon hairs. These are hair-like structures that come off the impodium. In, th in this figure, we have the claw, true claw, which is pad-like. Structures coming off of it that end in an expanded tip. This is a tenon hair. The other claw is on the other side. This is the impodium. It's claw-like structure, but it has these hair-like structures coming off. These are called proximal ventral hairs. But notice they just end in a, in, a, in a point. They don't have an expanded tip. So this is a ten hair here. This is a ten hair. These two are ten hairs, but the tips are broken off. So the claws can have ten hairs, or the impodium can have ten hairs, or both can have ten hairs. One thing we've noticed in, in using a lot of electron microscopy, especially the low temperature electron microscopy, is we're seeing what look like ten hairs on a lot of other groups besides uh, the tetranicids and the raphagnathoids. So we may need to redefine what a ten hair is at some time. 
Okay, other examples are examples of how the, here's some examples of how the pretarsis can be modified. Here is your claw, one claw, it's claw-like. Here's the other claw here. This whole structure here is your impodium, and it's pad-like. Notice that the tips of these hair-like structures all have, uh, are expanded. These technically could be called tenant hairs. Here we go in this one. Here's your claw, and it's claw-like at the, at the distal end. And then we have this little bump here. It's maybe an impodium, or maybe something else. Normally, we think of this group as not having an impodium. But with electron microscopy, we're seeing structures we weren't aware of. Over here, and uh, here we got uh, one claw, another claw, and we have 10 hairs coming off the claw. Another example, this is a tidyid. Here's your pad-like impodium. And good, notice the tips on this, the hair-like structures coming off, they appear to be 10 hairs. Here's one claw, here's the other claw, Here's an area fired. They don't have any claws. They just have an impodium that maybe ex is usually expanded in what they used to call a feather claw. This is omega, which they used to call a claw in the area fired. And then we have here, this is an althrom. This is a paracetin gone. Here we have your paired claws, very obviously, claw-like and paired. Then we have this structure. Most People, even a lot of acrologists, when they look at that, say, oh, that's the impodium. No. It's actually modified CD called eliform CD. And then we go over here to this one. This is a hexathrombium. This is a microtrombodiode. I put this in here just to show you there's a lot of variation. This whole structure is tarsus of leg three. This is your impodium. This is your claw. The other claw is gone. This neat structure up here, tree-like structure, is actually a modified CETA. Now, you're not likely to see these on your plant inspections, but I want to put this in to show you that there's a lot of variation. Normally, we think of if you see paired claws, two structures, they're paired claws and no impodium. If you see one structure, we assume the claws are missing, and that's the impodium. There are taxa out there where you have two structures, one is the claw, and the other is the impodium. So you have to be careful when you look at it. Usually the impodium is different from the claw. It may be longer, it may be thinner, but you can usually tell the difference if you look carefully. Here's some other examples. Now, not all mites have pretarsis. There's an iolanid, and uh, there are no, no, no impodium, no claws. Here's a uh, tetranicid. Here's the impodium, and it's bifurcate. Here's another tetranicid I showed you before. Here's your claw. Here's your impodium. There's your tent hairs. And these are what we call proximal ventral hairs coming off the base of the impodium. They're not coming off the claws. And in the tetranicidae, the arrangement of the claws and impodium, tent hairs, proximal ventral hairs and so on, and how it's split are very important characters that, that you need to identify them. Plant feeding mites in the prostigmata. This is a cladogram showing basically the arrangement, at least what we think now for the mites. Uh, there'll probably be changes, but each of these red marks represent a group that has evolved plant feeding. The triangles are probably the minor groups. The stars are the three major ones, tetranicidae, tetranicoidea, which are all obligate plant feeders. In the heterostigmata, the tarsinemids, there's a couple genera that are obligate plant feeders and very important pests. And then the areophyids that are all obligate plant feeders. These other groups, tideids, are not important economically important plant feeders, but some of them are plant feeders. They're mostly fung fungivores and um, facultative predators. Eupidoids, there are a couple families that are obligate plant feeders. They're localized major pests, but not a major pests on the world, in the world as far as we're concerned. Raphagnathoidea, 
There's one family, Stigmaids, where some members of one genus feed on mosses. They're not economically important, but they are plant feeders. In the Parasitan gonad, there's one genus, Balaustium, in the Erythridae, that feeds on pollen. There are reports out of Australia that it is actually a plant pest, that it will feed on plants and actually cause damage. Those reports need to be confirmed, but normally they're primarily predators and feed on pollen. So we're going to cover the Tetranicoidea, Eryphioidea, Tarsinemidae, and Pentheliidae. We're not going to cover the Tideids, Stigmaids, or Erythraeids because there's enough time to cover them. And they're not really major plant pests. Some of the references that are for the various mite groups, the Eryphioids, there's a key pub, last published in 2003, Key of the World Genera. That's about the only key available. Um, there's the Eryphioids of the United States. This is more, more a pictorial type book. There's, you look at the plant host and then look it up and look what Eryphioids have been reported from it. Uh, illustrated guide to the abnormalities of plants. That's useful. It's mostly, again, a picture guide. And if you want information on biology of Eryphioids, there's the uh, Eryphioid mites uh, from the crop World Crop Pest Series. Tetracoidea, there are lots of books on Tetracoidea. Um, some of these are not available anymore, but if you get them, they're good references. The one for the United States from 94 is Baker and Tuttle. That's out of print, but you can get uh, a uh, CD version of that book. Bull and Gutierrez and Fleckma, this was a catalog of the spider mites. That's good in in, but it's dated from 1998, but the spider mite web uh, is now maintained and updated. Here's the website for that, and that lists all the species of spider mites. It lists all the hosts that have been reported in the literature and all the countries they've been from. What it doesn't do, it doesn't tell you what mites were in each country, but um, it's useful. It's very useful because it's up to date. Um, then there's uh, Anatomy and Fine Structure of Revipalpus Mites, fairly recent from last year. And then there's uh, the old Pritchard and Baker revision of spider mite family. While this is very old and the taxonomy is outdated, the figures are very useful, the information is very useful, it's just the taxonomy is outdated. General plant mite books, Jepson, Kiefer, and Baker, again, it's out of print but it has some general information on, on phytophagous mites and mites associated with plants. Uh, obviously, all the pesticide information in there is out of date, but uh, it still has use, it's still useful. Uh, Ochoa, Aguilar, and Vargas from 1994, Phy Phytophagous Mites of Central America. This is a very useful illustrated guide. It's again, it's a, a illustrated guide, it's not really for keys, but it has a lot of colored pictures of damage and various mites, so it's useful even though it's from Central America. Um, out of South Africa, from Meyer, 1996, uh, pest mites and predators of cultivated plants of Southern Africa, mainly vegetables and berries, that's useful. And in greenhouses, uh, Zhang, 2003, mites of greenhouses, useful. There's no way to list all the literature here on, on, on plant mites, but with these are the major things, the major books that we're aware of. General Acrology, there's Krantz and Walter who edited the 2009 Manual of Acrology. Uh, this is very useful. It keys only to family level, but the keys are for all the families. So you can easily get confused if you're not aware of all the characters, trying to work through a key that covers parasitic families versus free living families. Uh, and there's a, I've not seen this book, this manual of acrology in Portuguese. Uh, I understand it's a good book, I've not seen it. Predator Mites, Gerson Smiley and Ochoa, 2003. This is a list of predator mites. Some phytosaids are included here, but these are all mites that are, are predators, mostly prostigmata. 
So you want information on a particular predator mite, this is a good reference. Although we're not covering phytosaids here, Denmark and Evans, Phytosaidae of, of North America and Hawaii, published just a couple years ago, uh, has keys to all the species of uh, phytosaids in North America. So it has use, it's useful that way. And questions? How do you determine which structure is the empodium versus the cloud? In the prostigmata, the pretarsis consists of three structures, paired claws and empodium. In most cases, the paired claws are lateral and the empodium is in the center. So if you have three structures on the pretarsis, you have paired claws and empodium. If you have just two structures on the pretarsis, you just have paired claws. If you have a single structure, it's the empodium. Is there a known function for trichobothria and how variable is the structure? The bothridial base in the trichobothria is, is fairly consistent. It's a cup-like structure in the, in the cuticle. The ceta itself can vary from a long filamentous ceti to a globo ceta. And we believe the function for the, for the trichoboth, the whole ceta and the base is primarily for sensing vibrations or air movement or both. I think identifying leg segments can be confusing. Beyond knowing that it's the segment closest to the body, is there a straightforward way to recognize when the coxa is freely articulated and when it's fused to the venter? To determine whether the coxa is free moving or fused to the ventral adiosoma, you look at to see whether the coxa is actually a discrete segment. In the case of the prostigmata or cariformes, you can tell no difference between the coxa and the venture of the idiosoma. There's no discrete structure separating them. 